and it is it, it is a, a spot where it causes some growth. Um, so we've we've looked at the kinetics of pure translation, where uh, where uh, of rigid bodies, where now even though the object's not rotating, it still has the effect of some moments that can cause changes in some of the forces. We looked at that in the and like the airliner problem we looked at, where because the the uh, thrust of the engines was not directed directly through the center of gravity, it caused a change in the reactions on the uh, landing gear of the aircraft. Even though there was no rotation of that of that uh, aircraft uh, during the taxi, then we also looked at uh, just pure rotation, where objects were not subject to any kind of translation at all, just rotation. Now we're going to put the two together into general plane motion, where we have the possibility of both translation and rotation going on. Uh, of course, the easiest example is a tire rolling on a, on a uh, on, a, a, on the ground, uh, either with uh, no slippage or maybe with some partial slippage, it could still happen. But the the point is that the the wheel, the center will translate to some other position, and the angular position of the wheel will have changed as it as it rolls. So there's the the uh, compound nature of both of these. Usually, too, we're looking at acceleration. So there'll be acceleration of the, lin of the center of gravity, but also some kind of angular acceleration. And so we'll look at a, a couple things with that today. Uh, the basic idea being, if we've got some object subject to several forces, and all kinds of things are possible. Perhaps subject to several moments of some kind in some direction. That the compound effect of those is going to be some angular velocity, perhaps some angular acceleration, and some translation of the center of gravity, wherever that might happen to be. So if uh, we then, oops, can't have the thing change from yellow to pink, that'd be too confusing. The compound effect of all of those is such that the forces will cause some bulk acceleration of the body. And in fact, if we if we put it in true kinetic terms, we might <coughs> have m times a sub g. So that's uh, essentially the net force. And there might be some net acceleration as well. So we have the, the three equations of motion. Broken into component directions. Or maybe you prefer to write M X double dot G, just to avoid an extra layer of uh, subscripts. Do the same thing in the y direction. And those components are the pieces of this resultant vector. Uh, in whatever coordinate directions we need. And then the sum of the moments. And 
mindsets might also be then, of course, uh, resulting in some acceleration. Now, to, to help Alex with the one question he had, if we do this about some other point besides the center of gravity, maybe about some point P, That's no trouble if we know the moment of inertia with respect to P, which we may or may not. It depends uh, on what the object is we're talking about and what other information we might have about it. But uh, if we apply uh, the parallel axis theorem to that anyway, it then sort of backs it up to uh, the angular acceleration with respect to the center of gravity plus this term MAGD where let's see if I match the match the uh, acceleration I had up there then that D is this perpendicular distance from the uh, line of action of the uh, net force, that MAG, to that point P. Noticing, too, that we need to take into account the directions of these things, that this would have a, an angular, this would have, this part here would have an angular uh, direction Tending, at least as I pictured it, in a clockwise direction. We have to take that into account with any other moments that are in the problem. So there's not anything terribly new there, other than what we've uh, what we've had already. However, uh, if you're short of um, equations, then you can always add into it any kinematics that are available in the problem, such as the no-slip condition. That's our, our most common one of the kinematics equations that we can add in there. But any of those other ones, the relative velocity, relative acceleration, uh, any of those type of equations are uh, fair game if uh, necessary to solve the problem. Necessary and useful to solve the problem. All right. So let's do a couple problems. There's nothing really new up there. It's just uh, we're getting a chance now to put it together so that we might have uh, both angular acceleration and linear acceleration in a problem now. Okay, so we'll We'll look at a type of problem, and then I'll give you a special in-class exercise to see who's been paying attention, if anybody. So imagine a, a spool with cord wrapped securely around the outside. And then a force. about a separate cord wrapped around the inside. Outside circumference uh, 0.5 meters. Inside 0.2 meters. mass of 8 kilograms and a radius of gyration of 0.35 meters. 
So spools made up of a, a couple different masses, all on the same axis, uh, but in, uh, in general we don't have that type of thing. In the book, uh, so sort of the radius gyration is uh, an indication of just how much of the mass is in the uh, interior spool part and how much is in the flanges on the outside. Okay. And we want to find alpha. And we can we can do it in two ways to uh, help illustrate that that very problem that Alex was bringing up. And it doesn't matter if we have a general motion problem or any of the other type of problems. The the dealing with it is the same. Okay, free body diagram. And a kinetic diagram, which is uh, uh, one that essentially shows the net result of what we have going here. Obviously, the two cords exert a force. However, in that one attached to the ceiling, we don't know how big that is. That has to be one of our unknowns. We do know how big F is though, of course. And then it's also got a, a weight. Those, the net effect of all of those together is going to be some acceleration of the center of gravity. So that would be essentially the, the net result of the force. And then we got to figure if it's doing that, it's because that's pulling that way, that there'll be an angular acceleration in that direction, and that's what we're supposed to find. All right, how many unknowns? that many equations. What are they? Acceleration G, moment of inertia, and angular acceleration. A G is unknown. What was the other one? Moment of inertia. Um uh, it's, it's still unknown but we're going to yeah, we'll, let's right let's assume uh, let's if we're given mass, let's not take weight as unknown because it's just so straightforward. And if we're given radius of gyration, let's not take um, moment of inertia as unknown because again, it's just a, a, a very straightforward calculation. Right. So and the tension and angular acceleration. We don't know this tension, and we don't know the angular acceleration. Uh, doesn't mean we need to find all three, but to find any one of them, at least, we're going to need three equations. What are the three equations? Sum of the forces in the y direction. Sum of the forces in the y direction. anywhere. But you picked first, you say what? Uh, which would be G, because of 
this symmetry, we know the center of gravity is there. Uh, and that will equal? I alpha. Well, be specific. I G alpha. There's two equations. What's the third equation? No. We're not taking the moment of inertia as one of the unknowns. So take that as given. That's just a, a straight calculation. Hopefully you remember it. So don't take that as an unknown. So don't take that as an equation. Then. So what's the third equation? Well, of course, is an exception. Well, that's not going to help. There are no forces in the x direction. So all we're going to have is 0 equals 0. We've used the kinetics equations available. So we need a kinematics equation. Maybe like g relative to that point where uh, the cable attached to the ceiling. Up here? No, down below. Here. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, for useful purposes, call that A. So what is the equation that we use there? It's got to be an equation that, that uh, has at least one of these in it. We don't want to introduce any more unknowns, but that's the only ones we have anyway. Um, T will be in here. T will also be in here. Alpha's in there. And G's in the other one. So hopefully something that relates one of the two pairs possible. That is just as simple as possible. Well, a, G, and Alpha. How? Because I think that's what Pat was heading towards. A, G equals... Equals what? We have to assume that this cable around the outside is not slipping. So it's a no-slip condition. And what'd you say, Jake? Before? Before you Jake decides your answer? A sits, it's a no-slip. We're assuming that the cable's not slipping. And since this part of the cable is not moving itself, then what's true about point A? It's what? It's it's not accelerating. Well, it's a, it's an instantaneous center, and so that's R one. We can then. Use that very same type of relation that we used before. AG is going to equal R1 alpha as a no slip condition, which I think is what you said, Jake, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so there's your third equation. All right, so set up these two equations. Um, we don't necessarily need to go through the actual solution of these, it's not an algebra class. Is that R1? Alpha, is that what you get from what Bob said? Or is that totally different? What part did Bob say? He said uh, AG equals A alpha plus oh. A G A. Yeah, that, that uh -huh. AG equals A, um, A plus A. Where, oh, let's say, careful, it's actually better. But AA 
is zero. All right, so set up the first two equations, make sure we got them right. components to this, one of them involving omega, we're assuming starting from rest, so that there is no omega at that instant, to eliminate the second component. So Prepare your equations, once you get them, forces in the y direction. Fairly straightforward, I hope. F plus T, they're in the same direction. No question about that, I wouldn't think. W's down. That's all the forces. And so, we then we'll have the uh, acceleration of the center mass. So there's F equals M in the y direction. If you want, you can then put in the um, no slip condition. What do you have then for WG? Oh, remember, it's good practice in these to indicate your positive direction so that uh, you can lay these out properly. Um, we expect acceleration up to get to go with a clockwise, so we might as well pick that as the plus direction. Save ourselves a minus sign. So, what do you have for the, some of the moments about G then? So F times R2. Is that positive? Yeah. yeah, it would be. And? Minus T times 45 meters. Minus TR1. And they, oh, Jake disputes that because he's erasing. And W goes, the weight of course goes right through G. And then that's going to equal IG, which is K squared M alpha. Yep. What's the M1 or M R1 alpha in the forces in the Y? That's M times AG. I just made this substitution. In fact, I also did it then. No, it didn't do it on that one.
and you can eliminate uh, T between them if you want. And uh, I don't need you to solve it. That's an exercise in uh, algebra. But you should get alpha 10.3 radians per second squared. And then T itself happens to be Nineteen point eight newtons. Uh, the weight itself is is seventy eight, so not much of the tension is, or not much of the weight is left on that on the uh, cable anymore. All right, so that spares you the algebra. It's just a matter of eliminating T between these two equations leaving you with one equation in alpha and solve for it and fill in the rest from there. Any questions on that part? So it, it always helps to make a free body diagram with the forces and then we can make it manage. Uh, I think so. Um, because it, for some reason, it's pretty obvious for this problem that the acceleration and the angular acceleration are in the same direction. But I have a problem coming up where it's not as obvious, and it's going to be quite helpful. It'll, it'll, in fact, it'll keep you from losing a minus sign if you uh, if you have that kind of drawing. Some of, some of the problems are so simple you can just put them on the same drawing. You don't need two separate ones. Just some kind of different indication of what the acceleration is. All right, now in direct response to Alex's question, let's do the sum of the moments about some other point. In fact, we'll just pick point A. Well, maybe I'll leave it up. Just for some comparison. solution, we can sum the moments about some other point, and then uh, that's no trouble if we also have the uh, moment of inertia about that point, which we don't. However, we do have it about the center. So we can go ahead and apply that um, as needed. So the moments about point A, again, we'll take that direction is positive. We know alpha is going to be in that direction, so it'll give us a, a clean answer. We have what moments being caused about point A? What moments cause about an F? F is a, a distance of both radii away. So it's R1 plus R2, and it is in that direction. All right, what else? W, of course, is in the opposite direction. And that's, uh, what about, is that R1? Yeah. Yeah, that's R1. And notice, we don't need to worry about the tension, which is the advantage of doing it this way, if you wish. It just eliminates one of the unknowns. IG we've got is K squared M. Alpha, we're looking for. And we will add, well, let's see, do we add MAG 
or do we subtract MAG? Uh, sorry, uh, MAGD. Do we add it or subtract it? That's our positive direction about point A, and that's what AG is going to do with the positive direction. It's also going to be in that positive direction with respect to point A. And in fact, there's the D we need as the minimum distance between the line of action of MAG and that point A. So this is MAG times D, which is also R1. The weight's helping that too, right? Sorry? And the weight is also helping uh, We have the effect of the weight in there. Oh. But it's not, no. This is, this is the, uh, this is the sum of the moments. This is the result of that sum of the moments. Okay, so I shouldn't have like a, a plus W on the other side or something like that? No. Okay, I can do that. Nope. Nope, just that. And then uh, notice that now you have a single equation with a single unknown alpha, the, the one that was asked for. And when you solve that, you get the same alpha you did before, 10.3. That help a little bit, Alex, illustrating that? Do you see the advantage to doing this? It's not huge, but it does eliminate uh, one of the unknowns. Uh, if the tension had been asked for, there might not be any advantage in doing this, but since the tension wasn't asked for, then uh, there definitely could be an advantage to eliminating it from the problem. Uh, we're going to do an example with a system of connected particles. Not yet. I mean like a link arm or something? Yeah. No, not yet. You've got, got, to, uh, got to learn to stumble before you can walk. You said that the MAGR that could be negative as well, you said, right? Yes. Can you think of an instance where that might be the case? Or? Uh, yeah. Uh, if if I had chosen the other direction, it would have put put minuses on those. Uh, remember, this is just an arbitrary choice. Uh, I chose it that way because I knew alpha would be in that direction. That would give me a positive alpha. Uh, it's nice if you know that direction. So if if we happen to have a problem where um, if AG is that way, but I picked that way as my positive direction, then that will give a minus MAGD because uh, uh, if that's my positive direction, the action of AG is against that. Oh, it would be a minus. It's, it it's as simple as that. Thank you. We got another one coming up where it is negative um, because it's a, it's a little bit trickier problem there. All right, any questions before I clear up and give you a give you a mental challenge like you've never faced before? You up for it, Bob? I bet you wish you brought a chocolate egg now for some energy. Or a bribe. Chocolate eggs go a long way to those extra credit points. That's for sure. All right. What I've got is a, a simple, simple little spool thing here with some string wound around the uh, axle. 
And I'm going to do two things. And you have to predict what's going to happen both times. So, first thing I'm going to do is let the string wrap around such that it comes out that way. And you need to predict what the spool is going to do. And to help with that, even though it may be obvious anyway, I want to see a free body diagram. You're going to pull the string out that way? Yep. That's what that means. Jake, what else does that mean? Right. That thing's just going to... Do you think that T stands for turn around and go the other way? That makes more sense. Is that thing going to be stationary? It's going to start from rest. I'm going to pull on the string T as shown. So a quick free body diagram. And then predict with it the kinetic diagram. Boy, these circles just aren't doing the business here. Oh, that's worse. It's starting to look like you guys. Better. And then draw the uh, kinetic diagram that will go with that. Center of gravity right at the center, of course. So, and, and no values to this. You don't have to predict the magnitude of any of this. Just predict its action. So first free body diagram, then the kinetic diagram. The kinetic diagram is the diagram that has uh, MAG on it, which is the sum of the forces, and then has IG alpha on it, which is the sum of the moments. It shows the, what you believe the sum result of those actions is going to be. Nobody's right so far with their kinetic diagrams. Oops. I mean, free body diagrams. We got one correct. Free body diagram. Get this stuff out of there that is not the object. Not why that not go to the ground? Okay. You can make these any smaller, Frank. Uh, I'm going to make a diagram around the launch Okay, yeah. So we have two, two correct free body diagrams. All right, obviously the tension's in there. However hard I choose to pull on the cord. Any others? Jake, you got something else? What else? The weight. The weight? I hope nobody disputes that. It's only cardboard, but... Is there any other forces? Uh, I got a normal force. A normal force because it's sitting on the table there. Frank, one other? Uh, friction. Friction. In which direction? Left. My attempt to pull it is to pull it that way. Friction is going to act in the reverse direction to that, to the left. So that's the free body diagram. What do you think is the kinetic result of that? First, uh, is T going to be greater than F or F greater than T? T 
T's got to be greater than that. There's no way friction could be greater than the force uh, causing it. So we expect the sum of the forces will be that way. What about the sum of the torques? In fact, don't we have a, a, a sum of the torques here, or a, almost a couple? They're not. It's not a couple since those aren't the same same magnitude, but it's like a couple, um, which will have some net result that way. The two of those together is most certainly going to cause it to turn counterclockwise or uh, clockwise. There, you did so. Anybody have anything significantly different than either of those, especially you folks that didn't have the friction and the normal force in? All right, so let's run the test. Let's see if if I pull this way, that's exactly what it does. What we think. This is so exciting. Because you just never know what's going to happen. It's like, like being at the science museum. Look at that. That was a beautiful demonstration. It did exactly what we thought it was going to do. All right, big deal. I could ask some dope out on the street to help me with that one. That I uh, asked to fill up in my classroom. All right, so let's, let's uh, do the same thing. And you predict what's going to happen. However, I'm going to put the cord on the bottom now. So on a free body diagram and a prediction via kinetic diagram of what's going to happen. so it doesn't slip. If I pull it with and it sets it, it slips, then God knows what's going to happen. Just 
go like that, and we don't have a very interesting problem. And we like interesting problems. Well, the, the, I need a bigger block under the chair, and that's in next year's budget. So when you take this again next year, we'll be ready. Alex, you set? Yes. Yeah? All right. Let's see what the free body diagram looks like. Uh, of course, there's going to be some tension there. What else? Still weighs something. I hope there's no dispute in that. What else? Normal force at the bottom there. And any friction this time? Yeah, why not? Other, otherwise, if I pulled on it, it would just simply slide along without doing any turning at all. So there will be some friction. Which direction? Well, there's only, yeah, there's only two choices. It's right and it's left. It's no Which like direction? I still you, feel like it should be left. You said right. Right. You said left. I'll say left. Left, left with a question mark. Bobby, you should know I didn't write right. I think it's right. I think it's right. 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 Imagine it's on not only ice, but greasy, slimy ice, the slickest thing known to man. Absolutely zero coefficient of friction, static or kinetic. If that was the case and I pulled on it, what would it do? It would go to the right. Since I don't have a greasy, slimy, snotty surface, then friction must oppose that. So friction must be to the left. I don't even understand. You got it right and you don't understand it? <laughs> Imagine what it would do if there was no friction. If I pulled on it, it would go that way. It wouldn't turn, but it'd just go that way. It might turn a little bit, just because the, the cable's off center, but in general, it would just slide that way. What? No. Friction, that means the friction would add to that force. And it would take off that way even faster. Friction doesn't do that. Does it? I know it's going to go a lot. Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's let maybe this will help. Let's imagine this. If you're not buying the no friction argument, let's imagine the infinite friction argument. Let's imagine this is a geared wheel. In connection with a a rack attached to the ground. Then what would it do? See, there's no possibility of slipping there. So if I pull on it that way, about an instant center there, isn't that a net torque on it that way and it's going to roll? What? It's going off the bottom, so it's going left. Right. Who says? Who says that that's gonna see that's that is a pretty small torque compared to that. So if we sum the torques about the center of gravity. We don't know what IG is, we're just looking for a sense of these. 
that's a very small torque about G, whereas that, if, uh, if we have that kind of friction, and that's all the gears could do, the, the, the wheel gears would push against the, the uh, rack gears, the rack gears are going to push back, that's a much, much bigger torque. This one goes that way, this one is much smaller and goes that way. How is this diagram really any different from the diagram we just had, other than the fact that the forces move down a little bit? Well, you don't have buying it, so let's see it. All right, cable coming out, strings coming out from underneath. I pull it lightly so it doesn't slip. This is like magic trick. <laughs> no, it's, it's a magic trick. It's a magic trick if you try to impose something on it that's not going to be there. If you impose a friction in the opposite direction, which shouldn't be there, there's a force to the right, there must be friction to the left. And it takes, it's amazing how little tension it takes to make it move. I almost do it with just the weight of it off the edge. So, now, what you need to do, because you guys are schooled in this and most of you got it wrong. Now, when you're old enough, this is a good bar bet right here. You know, pick some guy all muscly and got more money than brains. Say, hey, buddy, I'll bet you for a beer which way this will go when I pull. Really gonna write because it doesn't know how to draw five diagrams. It folds up. Like that. No, no. Yeah, most people, <laughs> most people look at that and, and think, you know, a few will say it'll do what it did. Most will say that it'll roll the other way. Start with this way, bet him this way, and then he gets a free beer. And then you say, oh, gee, we better go double or nothing now. And then put it that way and pull it. So, and so then, the reason we all fall is gonna go that way is because we're used to there being slippage. Yes. No, what everybody's thinking is that, that this is the predominant effect, and if the cable's underneath, it's got to turn counterclockwise. But that's, that's not. The, the friction has a much greater torque the other way. Remember, it's the sum of the torques that causes the angular acceleration. So if that radius was smaller, would it go left? Like, like what, what could we do to make that go left? Like why do we always, why do we think it's going to go left? Because obviously something is stupid. Um, obviously we've seen something that's done that. It's because you can see this force. I I, I guess it's because you can see this force, and so you think that's what. This is harder. This is always harder. I mean, students have all, always had a little bit more trouble placing the friction than they do other forces. There's no question about this. Once you if you if you thought friction was to the left then there's no other possibility but it going that way because we still have this um, uh, clockwise motion between the two forces and we have the, the net force that way. Oh, we didn't do the kinetic diagram. Oh, there's a plan of yo the the sum of the forces has got to be that way. Then the sum of the torques is that way. Um, even if you thought the friction was going the other way, that just makes two forces going that way. And if I said it wasn't going to slip, you should have even been more convinced that it would roll to the right like it did. Anyway, you can try that if you want. Just see how easy it is. It's amazing how how simple, how, how light a force it takes to move that. And you can do it with just a spool of thread too. You don't have to have something elaborate and cool like that is. That was my uh, that was my spool. Yeah, from my my kite kite line on my my big kite. All right.
Okay, another problem. Let's step up here. Now, this one also you may need to uh, argue with your intuition a little bit. Imagine my truck. Notice my truck is not pink, even though my car is, and they look kind of the same. There's my truck. Upon it, I have maybe this spool that I was transporting. All right, give the truck an acceleration of, let's say, five feet per second squared. The spool is not tied down, unsecured, so find the angular acceleration of the spool. Let me give you some of the details on it. Its weight is 200 pounds. Its radius of gyration is 2 feet. Its actual radius is 3 feet. So it's got a little more mass towards the rim than it does towards the axle, so the, the uh, radius of gyration is more towards the rim. The All right, now, oh, there is another part you need. You need the uh, coefficients of friction between the spool and the truck bed. Kind of low. Must be some grease on that truck bed. I'll have to have it cleaned. And that weight is just the weight of the spool. Weight of the spool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. First thing. Perhaps a free body diagram of the spool. Obviously, it's got a normal force. It would accelerate right through the truck bed. Any other forces on it? Friction. In what direction? Left. Let's say right. Right. Left. Right. right, right, left, left. Come on, Colin. I told you this. 
this isn't a presidential election where you can sit out. You remember the question? <laughs> We're looking for the friction force at the base of the uh, of the spool as the truck accelerates. Left or right? Or I guess the possibility is zero. There is no friction. Couldn't possibly be because because uh, in the extremes. It sits right there and the truck accelerates away. Uh, then it's dragging across the bed of the truck. There's got to be friction. Uh, also, uh, as it accelerates, it accelerates with the truck. In that case, there'd have to be friction because otherwise the truck wouldn't be dragging it along. So somehow there's friction either way. Can't be no friction. So what do we think then? To the right or the left? Right. You change your answer? No, You're right. staying with right? You're going to right. Stay right. Stay right. Right? Uh -huh. Jake doesn't know. Jake wants a new force vector for our classes <laughs> like that. <laughs> Sorry, Jake. <laughs> Not going to happen. Colin, you voting yet? Bobby, you said right, yeah. and uh, Pat, you changed to right. That's true. Why do you think it's right now? Uh, because I think the spool is going to roll to the left, so first to the right. Now, what you have to think is not what the spool is going to do, because that's not maybe as obvious as we just saw. What you have to think about is what's causing that. It's the truck trying to go to the right. It's going to have to drag the surface in, in contact with in the same direction as it's going. So that's the friction force because that's the way the truck bed's going to move. And the truck bed's going to try to drag that with it. Now, what happens from there isn't as clear. Um, if there's no slip, then it'll pull the... the the uh, spool along in that direction, it'll start to turn in this direction, which means it'll roll a little farther back on the truck, which kind of makes sense. That's why they tie these loads down, uh, at least part of it. I assume there's other reasons. Um, if it does slip, where the truck pulls away so quickly, it, uh, there's actually some slipping, there's still going to be this little bit of friction. It'll still tend to roll backwards. So uh, there's our kinetic part for the rotation, I think. Is everybody comfortable that it's going to do that? How about, though, for uh, MAG? Where's the center of gravity going to go? I still think it's going to go left. There's no slippage. Is it? What you have to imagine is you're standing way out here on the side of the road and you're looking and you're seeing this kind of thing happen. You see the truck pulled away. You start to see the, the uh, spool roll off the truck. However, if you're looking just at the spool itself, not looking at the spool and the truck bed, if you're looking just at the spool itself, will the spool a little bit later be here in the same place or here no matter where the truck is? We have these possibilities. Here's where it starts. A second later, the truck has accelerated to there. Let's draw it a little longer just so we can get it on here. There's three possibilities. That the spool will have gone forward itself a little. The spool will have stayed where it was anyway, or the spool will actually go backwards some. 
if you had to calculate that to roll it? Nope. It's all there on the board. I'd have to go forward to the legs. Remember, <coughs> what we're looking for is where do I put the arrowhead on the MAG vector? That vector is the sum of the forces. There's the only force in that direction. So it must be in this direction. So this is a case where the spool is going to move forward, but it's going to roll backwards because of the motion of the truck bed itself. Relative to the truck, if you were sitting on the truck, you were sitting right there, you would see the spool start to roll off the back of the truck. But as we look at it out here, we're going to see the spool go forward even though its rotational motion will be backwards because the object it's on is also moving forward. So you have to trust the diagrams. There's only one force going in the horizontal direction. That's got to be the resultant acceleration of the center of gravity. So then the equations of motion. Is that one as a starter? which aren't just the two things we just mentioned. So, oh, by the way, of course, center of gravity right at the middle there. We do have forces in the y direction. However, there will be no acceleration in all that direction. So all that tells us is n equals w in this case. So uh, we can put those together to say mu w equals m a g. I have a question. Is that fair? What? Why, don't, why are we giving the uh, coefficient of kinetic friction? Because we don't know if it's going to, s to uh, slip at this point or not. Oh, so if not the truck goes slip. fast enough, it will actually skid backwards relative to the truck bed a little bit. If the truck doesn't go too fast, then this will be a static friction situation. So which is it? Because now we've got the coefficient of friction in there. And we have two choices. Well, here's what we can do. Assume one or the other. Then we can solve for this, uh, the forces involved and see if, uh, if our assumption was right. That's especially easy with um, the static one because remember the static coefficient, the static friction is quite variable. It goes from a minimum of zero up to a maximum. Oh, sorry, Jake. <laughs> She was. Don't stop me ever in the middle of a word. <laughs> All right, let's back the tape up a little bit. You think I was talking to you? <laughs> assume we can. Let's assume no slip. We work with that most often anyway. It gives us an extra kinetic equation that we need. Therefore, the maximum possible friction is if we're right at the limit. And uh, we got all that stuff. We know the maximum possible static friction is 30 pounds. If we solve this problem, and let's see, we've got, uh, what, three unknowns, F, Alpha, 
an AG, but we've got that kinetics, kinematics equation for alpha and AG if we assume no slip. So we can solve for F, check it. If it's less than the 30 pounds, then this assumption is good. If it's greater than the 30 pounds, then the assumption that there's no slip won't apply. And we'll have to redo the problem then. All right, then we also need to sum the moments. And we can do it about G. We can do it about the contact point. Either one's going to work. It's your choice. Do you have a preference, summit about G or summit about the contact point? There's one for G. Nobody else uses G. Most students do tend to prefer that. Uh, just because that MAD stuff tends to be uh, a little bit tricky at times. But How much now? How would you summit about the other point, the contact point? Well, then you've got, oh, wait. Nope. you've got, well, all three forces go through there. Yeah, all right. I was saying I saw a little one right there, and I was like, wait. In fact, that's, that, I hadn't thought of that before. Well, let's finish this, and then, and then, uh, then we'll talk about it. All right, there's some of the forces about G. The only one we have is friction. Uh, pick a positive direction. Ah, we don't have to, it only does one thing. Um, what F times R. The normal and the weight go right through there. Um, yeah, we've got the, we've got the uh, radius of gyration. have one other small problem though here. That's that the bed itself has its own acceleration. So that uh, ex the acceleration of the center of gravity is going to be tempered somewhat by that, that acceleration. So the acceleration G relative to T, that's the business we've got. That's the no-slip condition we can apply there. Um, and in this case, we know that these are going to be uh, opposite. So we're going to need a minus R alpha there. because these, this uh, forward acceleration doesn't match the backward rotation. So I think that's the, the trickiest part there. But now we've got enough to solve it.
this wouldn't work, and we'd have to assume that there was slippage. No, it, with with everything we have here, we can solve for this force of friction. We've got uh, alpha is unknown. Uh, we've got that to link alpha and AG because AT is known. We can solve for the force if that force of friction is less than this 30 pounds then our assumption was good because we have up to 30 pounds of static friction available if we go over that it breaks loose and starts to slip what Ruby? Well, we can solve for them. We've got we've got enough here to solve for them. You can take AG here, put it into here. That eliminates. We're now assuming static friction. Uh, that uh, eliminates uh, AG. Wait, no, I'm sorry, we don't want this. That is, that's at the static limit. We want, uh, we want to leave it like that. So, F equals M, A, G, uh, we get A, T minus R, Alpha. And then you can put that into there, solve for alpha. And then go back and solve for F. What? I guess I didn't understand. So I did it backwards. I assume like this? I assume that F was 1.15 and I solved for alpha and then put it over there. No, F isn't 0.15, the static coefficient of friction. And you don't want to assume we're at the static limit because we don't know that we are. We just want to know if we're under the static limit. I assume that was 90. I used the 30 for that. Okay, but then there's no assumption. Uh, well, this is the assumption of no slip here, uh, but there's no way to check it, I don't think. So you can put that in there. And then solve uh, that single equation for alpha. Then when you get alpha, you can put it into here and see what f is and see if it's greater than the 30. We can assume no slip. We can't assume that we're at the static limit. All right, so you can double check this. Everything here is known except alpha. You can solve for it 1.154. And then Friday, we'll double check whether or not our no slip condition is okay. How is friction equal to m times our quantity? What is what? This? No, on the left side. Here? No, same equation down below. Here. On the left side. Yeah. I, I put AG into here for F, and then I put F into here. So this is F times R, F times R. And then the right side of the equation is the same, unchanged. Because that eliminated F from the equation to give me alpha. I'm just unsure where this 
equation came from. Because normally I think of friction as mu times the normal force. At the limit, yes. We're not at the static limit. That's what this is. Here's the static limit. We're assuming that we're not slipping, but we're not assuming we're at the static limit. Remember this, the coefficient, the, the uh, friction goes up to that point. Anywhere below that is static friction, is a no-slip condition. If we exceed that, which we now know to be 30 pounds, then things start to slip. So you can't assume we're right there. You can assume we're somewhere in here, which is what we assume with this. This is the no-slip condition. Otherwise, that wouldn't have been true. How do you know you're not at that? I don't know I'm not. That's what I'm going to check. When I, if I solve for F and I get 30 pounds, I'm right at the static limit. And I know if I do one tiny little bit more of acceleration, there'll be slippage. I don't know that I'm there. I said I could assume it's anywhere in here, but I can't specifically assume one place or the other. So what did you put that 